Welcome to the Impact Lounge. You are in the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast. I'm your host, TW, and with me, of course, is the man with the plan, BQ. BQ, say what's up to the people. Yeah, what's up, everyone? Glad to be back. Uh, not that we went anywhere, but, you know, this is a fun time. Of, no, we didn't do a show last week, did we? Yeah, we did a show. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, even know some of Yeah, we did, but, but we this, did. Is our, this is a good time of the week every week to, to sit here, talk, talk impact, the good and the bad, the good and the ugly. If it's your first time here, we're going to talk about the ugly. We're going to talk about the bad. We're not going to pretend something's good that's not. But if something's good, we're going to say it's good. That's going to be the difference between us and most uh, Impact Wrestling podcasts. That's right. No shade. No shade. No shade. <laughs> <laughs> it don't matter. Listen, we're here to give you the real. Like you know, like you said, listen, if you want fanboy podcasts, there are plenty of those out there. But this ain't it, man. You know what I mean? We're real wrestling fans. And just like you, there's some stuff we like. There's some stuff we don't. And we're going to call it like we see it. You know what I mean? We're going to call it right down the middle. And, you know, we think that's what people want. You know what I mean? So we're here to give the people what they (laughs) want, as my man Jalen Rose would say. So um, real quick, before we get started, uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Okay, so you are subscribed to the channel. Go ahead and hit the like button so that everyone knows how much you like this video and go ahead and hit that notification bell so that you get notified each and every time we drop some brand new fire content on this page. All right. So this week impact wrestling did, uh, they brought back Russell house. Russell house two was the episode this week. And Listen, if you watched it, then you know it's fine, but it's not really anything to talk about. So we decided that this week would be a good time for us to take some questions. We actually have been kind of missing the question segment for a little bit for a few weeks here. And uh, we figured this was a great time to get back into taking your questions from the comment section. So today we're going to kind of dive into some of the things you guys have been asking us, been wanting us to answer. and. It's just going to be a full episode of that. BQ, what do you think? I can dig it. I can dig it. Um, so the reason we wanted to do this, though, folks, was because we didn't know Wrestle House was coming at the time that we planned to do this episode. We thought it was just going to be a, a turkey suit episode, which I guess it kind of was that as well. But we thought it was going to be the turkey trot whatever episode, which we were unwilling to cover. So we wanted to do this. They did Wrestle House. I've, I'm only like halfway through Wrestle House, and... Um, I personally find that shit hilarious. I know there's a lot of people who don't like it. A lot of people who do like it. I think Wrestle House is hilarious. The throwback throwdown stuff, that to me is not hilarious. That to me is like a new level of bad. But um, so for those of you who don't think I just like, I don't, you know, that I dislike the fun episodes, you know, like Wrestle House is cool to me, uh, but we're just not going to review it. (laughs) Um, Even when I do finish watching it, but we wanted to do this instead of talking about uh, the turkey suit stuff. And we might do that. We might do um, some episodes throughout this year that are a little bit different because, you know, come December, there's probably going to be some best of episodes. There's going to be some award shows and stuff. Uh, and in the past, I've usually taken time off during that period because I don't want to recap that stuff. So, you know, we'll probably come up with some. We're probably not going to take time off, but we're going to come up with something, something, something better, something a little more original. You know, and that, uh, we're we're hoping to actually transition the cool factor in 2022 to possibly just doing a an original podcast, and uh, maybe not so much reviewing the show, maybe finding someone else to review the show. We don't know yet, so we're gonna figure that one out. But hope you guys dig this. Just something a little bit different for y'all. Yeah. All right. So from the questions segment, real quick. So um, our first question comes from a man, Duke at Duke Loves Wrestling on Twitter. Uh, that He's got a, a, a great podcast, Duke Loves Wrestling. Um, you guys check that out wherever you find podcasts, YouTube, and anywhere else. And his question uh, was, you know, of, the, of the, the stinging, biting variety, as Duke tends to do. Um, and so here we go. Duke, Duke's at, Duke asked, can Impact recover from what they lost 
by allowing AEW to bury them for the better part of last year, excuse me, for the better part of a year straight. They're watched by far fewer people today than they were before the AEW invasion. Um, all right. So BQ, you wanna you wanna you wanna start off with this one? So this is this is an interesting question. This is I think we have I think people have very different uh, differing levels of opinions on the AEW partnership. Yes, we I mean not yes, no, we didn't see big spikes in viewership other than that one episode. Now the first episode, the one where Kenny Omega was on and they drew all the extra viewers and there's 10,000 people on Twitch and and you know um, I don't remember how big the TV audience was. That to me was a missed opportunity because they didn't put out a good show that day. I don't remember what was on the episode. I just remember it wasn't good. And, um, you know, for the record, I don't think anything in the pandemic era was good, particularly with impact. I'm going to talk about that um, probably in a solo podcast later and just get into it more. Uh, basically, I think since Slammiversary on, that's when it's been like starting to get good again. But I wasn't a fan of any of the, of the arena stuff to be honest. So it's a little hard for me to be like, okay, it was a good episode. To me, most of them were not good, just to be totally honest with you. But that particular one with Kenny Omega, I don't think, I I remember it not being good. I remember a lot of people on social media and on YouTube saying, oh my God, I I remember why I don't watch Impact now. Things of those lines, yeah. uh, I mean, along those lines, a lot of them had to do with Josh Matthews on commentary. Uh, I remember I think Josh name dropped Kenny Omega seven times in the main event. Why are you laughing? No, no, no. It's funny. Like Josh Matthews, man, like common thread. People have hated Josh Matthews on commentary for a very long time. That's been like a common denominator in what a lot of people have hated about impact wrestling for a long time. Yeah. He, he turned people away for a long time, which uh, that was the main reason I wanted him off. I felt like the last year, year or two he was just bad but like the pop tv area and destination america era and stuff i thought he was fine i you know i didn't have too much of a problem with him but a lot of people were josh matthews um you know and and just some of the storylines and segments they had they didn't make sense like you have you to have an episode like that it probably should have been more wrestling centric not in the middle of a storyline where someone who's just tuning in for the first time has no clue what's going on I just feel that they really dropped the ball. And then when the, the Kenny Omega segment at the end, even though I found it entertaining, it didn't explain anything. He just rambled and talked in circles for 10 minutes. We were waiting for, okay, well, why are you there at the impact zone? Like, what, what do you want? And he never answered the question. And by the time the next week rolled around, no one had a reason to tune in. There was no cliffhanger. There was no nothing. Because they already fooled us once with tune in Impact Wrestling this Tuesday to find out why Kenny Omega this and this and this, yeah. and they didn't give us anything. So I thought that it was just a real missed opportunity. But there's different, different, different. Sorry, I can't say a word. Different opinions on on that relationship, if it was good or bad for Impact. We didn't see it in the viewership. Uh, I don't know if the YouTube numbers and stuff were going up and subscribers. I have no idea. Um, what I did think it really helped, though, was the perception of impact. I don't think we, we don't get those like LOL TNA and LOL impact. And I felt I feel like people start taking it a little more seriously because the other companies, especially AW, started acknowledging them. And it doesn't mean that they brought in this whole new audience, but but half the battle is being taken seriously. Mm-hmm. And I think they achieved that. I to this day I don't know what the purpose was of those Tony Khan Tony I can't talk today those Tony Khan ads where he was uh you know speaking negatively about Impact and they were joking and treating it like it was a joke and then you then Impact would post the ads on their YouTube I'm like what do you right. so I I to this day don't know what they were trying to accomplish I don't know if they were trying to like come off as the underdog uh from com- from conversations that I had with people in the know. What I do know is that they didn't want to come across like they felt like they were on AEW's level. They were realistic in saying, we're down here, they're up here. Uh, right. Granted, they've only been around a couple of years, but 
AEW is red hot. It's been red hot since it started. It's still red hot. I feel like Impact's in a lukewarm category. They were they were cold. Like the way right now, NWA is like ice cold. Impact yeah, was yeah. ice cold previous to this. So uh, I, I feel like they've gotten lukewarm. So which, which is a good thing. I, I'm, I'm, you yeah, know, they're yeah. trending in a good direction. Uh, but I do think it helped the perception of Impact. That's that's where I think the biggest biggest win was. I don't think they were knocked. You know, I don't think they were made to look. At the end of the day, I don't think they're necessarily made to look bad because I don't think people remember a lot of the early stuff. Um, maybe they do. I don't know. But I think my, with the exception of the paid ads, the biggest problem I had was that in the beginning, Rich Swan looked like a joke and he wasn't made to look credible in any way whatsoever against Kenny Omega. I don't understand why they did that. They, they painted him as an underdog. But at no point did he get any kind of comeuppance on Kenny Omega. He didn't even, you know, him and the Motor City Machine Guns, they just they were just knocked on their ass every episode. Right. right. You know, and then when the actual match happened, and it might have been because uh, we assume Rich Swan got hurt. But when the match actual match happened, at no point did it look like Rich Swan was going to win the match. And those those are, I'm glad that was at the very beginning because that was the biggest problem I had with the whole thing right. uh, was the treatment of Rich Swan during that to where it even it even turned impact fans against him they were just like you know what a weak champion da, 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 da. you know so but to answer that question i don't think there's any bouncing back to do because i think they improved their perception the perception of the company improved quite a bit uh i think the good brothers probably hurt impact a little bit showing up on AEW because they weren't super well received over there but I think they're in a good place right now because since, since Slammiversary, they have built this roster up really well. So if they had that same roster that they had prior to Slammiversary, I'd be like, dude, they're, they're dead. But mm-hmm. I think right now there's a lot of intrigue because they brought in a lot of really interesting talent. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So <clears throat> that was my turn. Duke, you blasphemous blowhard. Listen, you Whoa. couldn't be more wrong about this, okay? Like, you, listen, you ask, can Impact recover from letting AEW better bury them for the better part of a year? And I, I don't have access to Impact Wrestling's books, but if by recover, you mean count all the money they made, then yes, I think they can recover. Because from a kayfabe storyline, yes, they willingly played the role of AEW is coming in here running over us and we're going to play a bit part in the Kenny Omega is the greatest wrestler storyline. Yes, but but from a number standpoint, from a real business standpoint, they did their highest pay-per-view numbers in years because of the intrigue of what's going to happen with Kenny Omega Um, Kenny Omega versus Rich Swan, Kenny Omega versus Moose, uh, who's going to take the title from Kenny Omega, all of that stuff. And this whole concept of the forbidden door that is all over wrestling right now started with who? With Impact Wrestling and AEW. And everybody that New Japan is sending sending to AEW, they're sending them to Impact too. So Impact and Scott Demore helped repair that relationship with New Japan and has them working with AEW, who they weren't working with uh, also, and it's really helping everybody out. So uh, can Impact recover from letting AEW bury them? Listen, you got to understand the difference between storylines and and business. And from a business standpoint, this was a home run for Impact Wrestling. I don't think you can argue that. And then from, uh, again, from a business perspective, what have they done with what they got from the Kenny Omega storyline. Well, they took Moose, who, and I was very critical of this. They built up two years of equity of Moose beating people person after person at pay-per-view. I think Moose went like two years being undefeated on pay-per-views. And then they had him lose to Kenny, lose to Rich Swan to transfer that credibility to him and then have Rich Swan lose to Kenny Omega so that Kenny Omega could come out on AEW with the TNA World Championship and the Impact World Championship so that he could eventually 
lose those back to someone from Impact. Now, did they protect Kenny Omega? Hell yeah, they did. And did they keep that tight, keep him from losing that title back to Impact? Hell yeah, they did. And would that have been much better if Impact fought to have someone from Impact actually take those titles back from Kenny Omega? Absolutely. But what that did lead to was this Josh Alexander storyline, which is this concept of a homegrown Impact star working his way up and getting a chance to challenge for that world title that was held by Kenny Omega. And again, even though he didn't get it off Kenny Omega, he got it off the person who got it off Kenny Omega. And then they brought Moose back into the picture who they protected when he had to take on Kenny Omega. So Impact only elevated from this. Long story short, Impact only elevated from this. And for you to say that far less people watch them now than before before they involve AEW, listen, their viewership goes up and down anyway. R- ratings collection data is fugazi. Nobody can convince me that stuff is real uh, or accurate, but it is what it is. Um, but what I was telling people about this conversation from the beginning who were complaining about AEW bearing impact is y'all weren't talking about Impact before they got in bed with AEW. And a lot of y'all, including you, Mr. Duke Loves Wrestling, haven't been talking about Impact since, okay? So the AEW thing was very beneficial for Impact. The uh, Forbidden Door AEW partnership, it was not an invasion. It was never an invasion. The working relationship with AEW was very beneficial to Impact. So that's my answer. You got 24 hours to reply. Because, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because at the end of the day, building Josh Alexander, building a home, homegrown star was the, was the goal. And they're, they're getting there. So, Well, the goal was to get more it. eyes on the product. Well, right? that too, yes, yeah. And again, you can argue that from week to week, more, more people aren't watching, but... We don't know their subscription numbers for YouTube. We don't know their subscription numbers for the Impact Plus app. We don't know what the pay-per-view numbers are, but we know that people have publicly come out. Even people who always crap on Impact Wrestling, uh, many of you, Lord and Savior Dave Meltzer, uh, proclaimed that their pay-per-views with Kenny Omega were their highest pay-per-view buys in years. So, again, you, you can't really argue that Impact benefited from working with AEW. I agree. Um, all right. So let's see. BQ, you got a couple of questions from, okay, let's, from the people? Let's see what we got here. All right. Uh, Minor Lopez sent me this. He just sent me this right now, as a matter of fact. Um, interesting. So uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit off air. He's saying since Bound for Glory in Vegas – Impact has drawn a very good crowd. Should they remain doing shows mainly on the West Coast? Is this a good hub for them? Whether it's uh, now, I'm paraphrasing. Is is it a good hub for them out, out in Vegas? Because before, remember we when when we knew they were going to Vegas, we we're like, oh man, those crowds sucked. And it doesn't appear that's the case now. And uh, the only other West Coast, they did a couple West Coast shows, the big time wrestling collaboration in NorCal, and then the Unbreakable show in orange county so and and those both were pretty well attended the the unbreakable one was mainly because they did it at the same time of a uh like a gaming con so there was a lot of people there that were just there but um i don't know is this is this a is this a better hub for them than i don't know some of these other spots that we've seen um well since the uh beginning of the scott demore regime their best attendance by far has been in uh, St. Clair College in Windsor, uh, Canada. So I am i can't wait until they get a chance to get back there. And honestly, I've been saying to myself, if they do so well at that venue, there has to be a bigger venue in that vicinity that they should try. Um, but if they're doing good business on the West Coast, then yeah. I mean, look, I, you know, where, go where the people are. I, I would love to see them in some of these, you know, very wrestling uh, supportive towns like Chicago, uh, Philly. Um, you know, th- there's places in Texas 
Um, I think the Dallas area is very, very wrestling supportive, uh, you know, different places in Florida. So go where the people are, man. Any place where there's like rabid fans. There was a WWE show in Norfolk, Virginia a week or two ago. And that crowd was ridiculous. The, um, the Norfolk scope that, that venue has been there forever. Uh, I I've seen it on wrestling for a couple years, for for many years, I even played there uh, when I played in arena football. When I played in the arena football league. Um, I played at the Norfolk Scope. It's a great venue. And the people there, they're great wrestling fans. They obviously, um, they, they, they love wrestling. You know, that might be an area Impact wants to try. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, if you're selling on the West Coast, then keep booking on the West Coast. Yeah, so as, as you said, Book where the people are coming. So I was listening, though, to Cornette this morning. <laughs> and um, they were talking about AEW where they do shows. And they said they're the only wrestling company. I, and I, I've said this about Impact, that they should do this. But they have a completely different battle logistically than AEW. But in the past, I have said they should do this. But they what they were saying is that AEW, you can tell that they purposely go to s certain cities instead of like, hey, we're going to make sure we hit all over the United States. We go where we know there's a fan base that are behind wrestlers we're trying to push. The local, he's like, that's why we go to, you know, uh, there's no, no secret they did Chicago when CM Punk debuted. Right now, if you guys follow that show, Brian Danielson did a heel turn. The heel turn was meant for John Moxley, but he's out of commission. So Daniel Bryan turned heel. They had him turn heel in Adam Page's hometown. And then uh, he had a, a match with the evil Uno. But then the next week in Chicago, he, because, you know, because the Dark Order is, they run with Adam Page. He said, I'm going to kick in every single member of the Dark Order's head. So episode one in Adam Page's hometown. Episode two, they're in Chicago, so he challenges Colt Cabana. So now the crowd is behind Colt Cabana. They're booing Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson by default. And then next week's in Atlanta. So he's uh, wrestling um, Adam Five Angels, who's from Atlanta. And I don't know going forward um, what cities they're going to, and, and, and I don't know if it's going to line up. But they, but they are very strategic on where they do their shows. If they're trying to push, you know, uh, you know, when Britt, Britt, Britt Baker started getting real hot, they mm -hmm. went to Pittsburgh. Right. You know what I mean? Um, when I was in uh, St. Louis the other day, they made sure to get Matt Seidel on the show because he's from St. Louis, place when you know crazy for him. And you know, I've said that about Impact. I said they did, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have an abundance of wrestlers from Ohio, well, especially they used to. Right, but they right, still right. have a pretty good, decent, decent amount from Ohio. They did an Impact Plus show in Ohio, did pretty well. Audience seemed really, really engaged. Haven't been back to Ohio. Like if you're trying to get, there was opportunities back then where you're trying to get Sammy Callahan over, or you're trying to get OBE, you know, over. Or, you know, you had Madison Rain at the time. You had uh, uh, the Rascals. You had uh, Jessica Havoc. Uh, yeah, Mad Mad Fulton. Like, there's a good, good number of wrestlers from there. And they just never tapped into that. You know, they got a couple guys from Michigan, uh, especially Rohit Raju. They didn't tap into that. Um, it, you know, these spots that they do go, they don't have any, you know, they don't have, no wrestlers seem to have ties to that area. Right. So... I know I'm not being super well spoken in what I'm trying to get at right now, but I think the Vegas mm -hmm. thing is a good thing right now. It seems like it's a good thing. The crowd, we can hear them, we can see them, you know, because even even when they brought back fans back into the arena, the way that they filmed television, you still only saw like eight fans, right. you know, right. and now you saw, you, you know, there's so many more people that now you see, you see more, you know, more individuals sitting there in a crowd, but. I would like to see them just tap into that, not so much 
okay, this, you know, we're, we do good on the West coast and we do, we go, we do good here. I want him to, I want him to be like, okay, we're trying to push this wrestler. Like you just brought up Josh Alexander. Like they're making him a thing right now. Go do a fucking set of tapings up there. Like allow that passionate crowd to get behind him on TV so that we, we feel it. And we feel like we're a part of that. And we want to get excited about him too. You know, how come, how come they never done anything where Eddie Edwards is from? You know what I'm saying? So, bro, that, that, I, that is a cash money point right there. Yeah. That is a cash money point right there. And you, you hit, you hit the home run. You hit it on a nail, a nail on the head. Can't figure out a metaphor here. But, um, <laughs> but, right. If you want Josh Alexander to be perceived as a big deal, you need to go where Josh Alexander is loved and people are going to cheer him. I think as fans, we all love Josh Alexander, but he keeps coming out to ice cold receptions. When his music hits, the people do not pop accordingly to someone who is in as good of a storyline as he is in right now. That doesn't, to me, and I I hate it. I hate it because I'm like, man, he is in a hot story right now. Why uh, Why are people, you know, giving him these tepid, receptions you know what i mean when he comes out um and and again i think if you're impact you gotta find a way to work around that if you know that josh alexander is hot in canada get your ass to canada if he's going to be being pushed okay like you you need to figure out a way to make it hot for your wrestlers you got to figure out a way to produce the show in a way that's going to help create the results that you want you can't just bank on the you can't you can't you can't hit record on the camera and just hope things work out like you planned them you have to find ways to massage it you know what i'm saying and and what you said is the perfect answer to that if you know that the next six weeks that we're taping are going to be about josh alexander chasing moose or getting closer to moose or going through more obstacles to help him feel like a bigger deal so that when we start taping the six week after that, he's going to do something else, then you need to put him in front of a fan base that is biased to liking him. You know what I mean? Like, bro, AEW has done like 12 shows in Chicago since September, since they signed CM Punk. They've done how many episodes of Dynamite and Rampage from somewhere in Chicago? They played the United Center a few times. They played some other buildings a couple of times. Like, they keep going to Chicago. And like you said, there is a reason for it. Yes, there's a pop- there's there's a passionate wrestling fan base there already. But also, he knows they're going to pop stupid for CM Punk. And that's right. smart. You know what I mean? You you the, the match after Hangman Page wins the, the AEW World Championship... You do the show in his hometown. It's not rocket science. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so that is one thing where Impact can take a page out of AEW's book for sure. And because they got to do, they got to do everything they can to help make these people feel like a big deal. That's stuff they can do. Because like I said, we all love the story that's happening with Josh Alexander right now, and we're all behind it. But they don't make it feel like a big deal when his music hits. And they got to find a way to do that. So that was, that was a great yeah. question. Yeah. What else we got? Um, he actually sent me a second one. So let's let's get into that one here. Um, so he said, at Turning Point, we saw a new sponsor. I believe it was an alcoholic beverage. Uh, so the question would be, what other sponsors could Impact get that would benefit them, but also help them draw new eyes of the product, both younger and older audience? So there was a... There was a sponsor, which we haven't seen on Impact in God knows how long. I did see that, yeah. It was Blue... Chew. No, it was Blue Chew. No, Blue Chew, was... yeah. <laughs> um, who was it? It was a Paps Blue Ribbon. Blue Ribbon. There we go. Is that, is that alcohol? Yes, it's beer. It's beer, okay. I'm not a huge drinker. Uh, fun fact, I, I drink alcohol for the first time. I'm 42 now. I drank it for the first time at 31. 31 or 32. Oh, cool. Nice. So I, I, I drink once a year probably now, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. I'm not a, I am not an expert <laughs> in alcohol. So interesting sponsor. Someone, 
had told me they're sponsoring another wrestling company too. It might have been NWA or MLW or something MLW. like that. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything too special. You you know what I mean? Um, I know they had a commercial with um with uh God, I keep wanting to say the Miz. It's not the Miz. It was uh Zack Ryder. They had a commercial uh, with um uh, with Matt Cardona, yes. and I think Chelsea Green and um, Brian Myers were in it too. Right. Okay. I remember that. So there, there's a, you know, there's a relationship there. Who knows how much the sponsorship will help them? You know, I don't know um, if it's a financial deal or what they have set up. We have no idea. I don't know that there's a sponsor out there necessarily that would be, that would help with eyes on the product. I think any sponsorship deal they can get, any business opportunity they have, I think they should, um, you know, it's always going to be good to help bring revenue and money in. Right. But I don't know if there's anything out there that, you know, that would help the eyes on the products necessarily. Yeah. You know. I... Well, let, let, let me cut in here for a second. With, um, when it comes to like sponsorship deals, um, you can create barters. Like you said, it doesn't always have to be like a, a, a financial deal. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be like, you're going to pay us X amount for this advertisement in this space. It can be something like, um, you know, you're going to, you'll pay us some amount, but, you know, we'll give you mentions and, and that type of stuff. And in exchange, you will put uh, five of our contracted talent in national advertising. So there can be, you know, things like that, that, you know, help boost the, uh, the visibility of the product. So there are ways that things can benefit from each other. And again, you always hear talk about like these key demographics. So the 18 to, what is it? 18 to 49 demo. Yeah. Um, like, you know, that's a beer drinking demo, right? You know what I mean? And so like, True. there's a, there's, that's definitely the type of thing that you would want, the type of sponsor who could help you out in that demo. So I, I think this could be um, a very beneficial partnership. Again, like I said, we don't know if it's just um, the type of thing where they're just paying for exposure, like, you know, give us X amount of mentions, you know, give us a, a, a topic bar here, give us a, you know, a, a slate here or a tombstone here and, you know, and we'll pay you this amount of money. You know, it could be that, or it could be some sort of barter situation. Like there's really, there's a lot of ways that deals get done in um, in the business world. And if it's done smartly, then it could be something that does help with impact, um, with, with, imp with getting eyes on the product. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll never know. Only time, we will know. Only time will tell, right? If we start seeing uh, Deanna Perrazzo jogging down a beach with a Paps Blue Ribbon in her hand, then, <laughs> you know, we'll know that that's probably part of the deal. So, um you know, so so time will tell. But um, but it, it, is that something that could help get eyes on a product? Yes, it, it is if it's done, you know, properly. Yeah, it would help from a brand recognition standpoint. But at the same time, an audience and a target audience are two totally different things. Like mm -hmm. we could play our podcast in front of one million people here in the mm -hmm. States right now who aren't wrestling fans. Right. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're going to have a, a million subscribers the next day. We might have 10. Right, because right. a million people who aren't wrestling fans watching a podcast would be lucky to get 10 people subscribed the next day. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's good for brand recognition. You know, if they, if they were able to work out, you know, we do see wrestlers popping up in ads and things of that nature. But I think from a financial standpoint, it's probably the best way it, it would help the company overall. Any kind of sponsorship mm -hmm. at this point. Sure. So. All right. That's a good question. Got anything else? Um, nothing on that. Do you have another another question from uh, anybody else? Off let's, see, good? let's see. Let's see. Um, all right. So, uh, Pat Carlton Mel. Um, I said that really fast. So, if I messed it up, I'm sorry. Let's see. He said. Um, he said, should Impact be worried about international deals when they come up now that AW is around? So what he's trying to say is, you know, recently we know they don't, they, they, their deal in the UK expired. They've never, they haven't gotten a new UK deal, which to my knowledge was their second most lucrative deal. 
Could be totally wrong. To my knowledge, it was, though. Um, he's basically saying, you know, they pride themselves on running in 120-some countries. But when these, country, when these contracts start running up, are some of these companies going to be like, well, we're, we have more interest in AEW right now, or we have interest, you know, uh, or, or we want to work with this company or that company, you know, now that there's other options out there, he's saying, is, is that going to help? You know, do we think, cause we don't know, we're not on the business side of things, but do we think that would hurt their bargaining power uh, of renewing these deals? Um, so again, like, I don't know the, um, you know, I, I, I don't know the, the specifics of the deals, but, you know, I remember when AW first, you know, came out uh, with Dynamite and I was hearing a lot of things about, you know, it being on at weird times in different countries. So that leads me to believe that they don't have great international distribution. So there could be some competition for those deals. Um, now, again, we don't know how strong those deals are, right? If those if, if those people are locked into contracts with 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 impact for X amount of years before they have a chance to you know renew them or change them, we don't know how strong the clamoring is for AEW outside of the U.S. Um, you know, listen, AEW. I, I said it before. I'll say it a million times. Like AEW caters to a very particular fan base, and um, is that fan base is is what they're serving up to that fan base what international markets want to consume maybe you know what i mean maybe but um but yeah i mean like uh, you know I, I don't know here's here's the thing about impact wrestling okay i think that impact wrestling can do a lot more to make their product feel like a big deal i think that, I think that impact uh really really needs to do more to make their product feel like it's fun for the people watching at home so that the people watching at home want to feel like they're having fun with their watching and like they want to come out to your shows and have fun when your show is in their area. So AEW has that. They've got it. You know what I mean? So if I was a, a, a television provider and I had a chance to offer my viewers AEW or Impact, I'm taking AEW. Okay. Um, I just think Impact needs to do a better job of making their product feel like it's more fun, more of a big deal. It's just my opinion. Now, again, is that the case? Is that going to be a situation where some of Impact's international deals might be looking to um, swap out their product for AEW? If it is, I think Impact would be in trouble. Now, again, like I said, we don't know the logistics of those Impact deals. We don't know how long those deals are for. We don't know how hard those contracts are to break. Um, but if they were up for renewal right now and there was an option of AEW or Impact, I think Impact would be in some trouble. So I actually think kind of the opposite. I think that they have relationships with these. This is strictly speculation, folks. This is not inside information. Uh, I think they have relationships with representatives in these countries and these stations. and They, they have a history. And here in the United States, we're, we're, uh, we're about the glitz, we're about the glamour, we're about, does it look low budget, does it look high budget? You know, we talk about the lighting and we talk about this and this. I'm always talking about the music and all that. I just get the feeling that in many of these other countries, they don't care about that stuff. I think that they're, they connect with the product in a much, much different way way i don't think they care that the audience audiences aren't that big that they see in front of them in front of them i think if they like the wrestlers they like the product they're perfectly perfectly happy i think it's very different than how we consume the television here in the united states so if these particular markets if their viewers want the impact product then you know they could probably keep the impact product dixie carter which god knows if the things she says are even true but she used to say there were some markets that they did better than, uh, than WWE in. So I, I don't know how true that is. I, it's hard to believe that, but they know better than we do. But I think they have relationships established. The problem is there are other options now. So 
yeah, I would imagine some of those markets, they probably could lose pretty easily. But from my knowledge, these overseas markets and these overseas deals have what is, are what has kept Impact afloat all these years. People are saying, oh, can't believe they w didn't go out of business, but Ring of Honor did, and you know, this and this company couldn't get off the ground. When, when Impact was TNA and they established themselves years ago, they were able to get themselves on TV, get their, get their hands on TV deals that don't exist right now. There was a lot less on TV, a lot less competition. It was just a completely different day and age. Like AEW couldn't get those deals right now that Impact has in all these markets. I'm sure they are in a handful of countries overseas. I'm sure they 100% are. But they couldn't do what Impact, what TNA did 16, 17 years ago, however long it's been. They couldn't do that. So that's what's kept, from my knowledge, and I want to say, you know, BQ said this and he knows, knows what he's talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about, but from my knowledge, that's what's really kept the, the company afloat for all these years and will probably continue to keep it afloat. Now, Anthem has come in and they've done a really good job with different revenue streams and, and everything. I think the... Uh, the YouTube insider thing, I think is going to help them out a lot financially. So I would imagine, like you say, you know, if, if, if the option is there, someone sees the big budget product, I'm sure some of these countries will probably be like, hey, we, we want that. We want the shiny thing. I, I personally don't think a lot of the other markets care the way that we do in the United States. You know, <laughs> that's my... And I, I, th I think that's, that's fair. I mean, like... Um... You know, listen, production value, I, you know, there's no um, production value is production value for a reason. You know what I mean? It makes your show look more expensive. Um, you know, it, it makes it like you put more effort into it. Um, and I think it does make people more interested in and, and people could have different sensibilities. You know, what I mean, some people could be like, I just want that. You know, I want that that hardcore wrestling. You know, what I mean, some people really. That, that's how some people might be, uh, that's how they might feel. That's how they might, you know, watch Impact and, and, and feel like they're delivering that and getting that from Impact. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'd be very interesting to see, you know, I, I'd be very interested to see, you know, what, uh, what, what those conversations are. Um, because like I said, I just don't think there's, there's an honest comparison between the two products right now. What else we got for questions? Agreed, agreed. Um, <laughs> I, I got to address this one on Twitter because this was just kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> we kind of put out, you know, a, a tweet asking for questions. People send their questions in and everything. So <laughs> one was kind of funny, uh, but we're, we're going to acknowledge you here because why not? Uh, sorry, I thought I had it up in front of me. So is, is this the, tur the turkey soup question? Yeah. <laughs> Gazel Toff is the, the uh, screen name. What was your favorite Turkey Sue match? So oh, man. I, I had to laugh about this because uh, your exact tweet that I said here was next week on a cool factor. We're doing an all Q and a mailbag podcast under the assumption there will be a silly Turkey suit episode, which we likely wouldn't watch. Right. Send us your questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> In the tweet, I'm like, silly turkey suit episode, which we likely would not watch. Right. And the question was, what was your favorite turkey suit match? <laughs> so the answer is none of them. I hate the turkey suit. And speak, you know, I said I was listening to Jim Cornette this morning, and they brought up the turkey suit. <laughs> and and uh, he, said, I mean, he said it was an idea of Vince Russo that he hated it, and he actually tried to steal the turkey suit at one point <laughs> and hide it. Uh, but he said someone caught him doing it. So, uh, bro, I got an idea, bro. Yeah, I got a an idea, suit, bro. Yeah, dude. And I like, I like Russo too, man. I've always been a Russo guy. So, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to acknowledge some of the, the stupid shit too. I, I don't like the Turkey suit. There's nothing about it that I like. It, it just, I understand it's a holiday episode every year or a holiday thing. They get a bunch of job guys and girls together, uh, some of the comedy wrestlers, and, and hey, the, the loser's going to wear this. You know, sometimes there's a food fight. Like, it's just not entertaining to me at all because I'm 
42 and that's something i don't even <laughs> think my kids would be watching that i'd be like that's funny so yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so to answer that uh i don't have a favorite right i could right. probably go back and watch all of them tonight and be like i don't like any of these right <laughs> right i mean listen um to answer the question yes uh i do not have a, a favorite turkey soup match the turkey soup match is trash um uh, but listen, it's, it's wrestling. Like wrestling does not always have to be, um, it doesn't have to always be like serious. It's wrestling, right? You know what I mean? Like it's wrestling, like wrestling's not always serious. It's often stupid and silly. And there's, there's tons of things in it that don't make sense. We're all in on the joke. We understand that we're watching grown men dressed up in underwear, oiled up, pretending to fight. We got it. We're, it's part of the joke, right? Um, but like the turkey soup match was always something that when I would see it on out of the corner of my eye, I would know that I don't need to sit down and pay attention to this. You know what I mean? So, um, so there is no favorite turkey soup match. It was just there. You know, I remember seeing Rob Terry wear it. I remember seeing Robbie E wear it. I'm sure EY has worn it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. There's no, there's no favorite turkey soup match. Turkey soup match is trash. Um, and but if you have a favorite turkey soup match, who who asked this question? God, what was this handle? Um, the handle was Gazeltoff. Gazeltoff, okay, Gazeltoff. If you have a favorite turkey soup match, go ahead and uh, uh, at me and at BQ and uh, let us know what your favorite turkey soup match was. But for the record, (laughs) the turkey soup match is awful. Uh, I'm glad it's going away, and I hope it never comes back. Did they bring? Did they do a turkey soup match on uh, Wrestle House? I, b- I believe they, there was one involved. I, I haven't gotten there yet, so you got to give Impact credit, though. They have done a great job of paying homage to their TNA roots. You know what I mean? Like they don't run from it, and they pay homage to it whenever possible. And I, I like—I actually do like that. I like that. Uh, don't like the turkey soup, but I do like. The, I mean, I don't. I don't hate the turkey soup. It's just, again, it's one of those things that when it's on, I just know I don't have to watch right now. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it kind of what I said at the top of the episode. I want them to have fun. I really do. I don't want everything doesn't have to be serious, but the fun stuff has to be good at the same time. So you know, like with Wrestle House. It was it was stupid, but it was good in my opinion. I know there's people who didn't like it. I it had humor that makes me laugh. At, like at one point, Caleb, Con- you know, uh, what the fuck's his name? Uh, Chris Sabin walked out because he there was a joke that he got out of the shower, and and Caleb with a K like touches his peck. He's like, hey, you're moist. Like just random as shit, but it just made me laugh because it was so off the wall. Mm-hmm. But that to me is good funny. The throwback throwdown thing that they got going up, going, you know, coming, that's bad funny. That was, it seemed like the company and the wrestlers had a lot more fun making it than we did watching it, or certainly than I did watching it. Even the people in the audience, the people, the audience was so dead for that show. Like they weren't having fun with it, nothing. Like it was just very, very bad, in my opinion. Again, some of you, I know some of you liked it because. People were mad at me on Twitter for for dissing it, but I thought it was really one of the worst things I've ever seen in wrestling. Like I was embarrassed to watch that, um, and I'm, I was actually really disappointed they were bringing it back again. But maybe maybe it'll be good this time. I just don't think it was. So I, I don't know. I, I think that we could we could do without that show. I, I, at first, I was excited because I thought it was an original concept. I'd give anything original, uh, you know, a chance. But I was like, yo, this is bad, bad, bad. Right. So. All right, fun is good, but fun has to be good. Yes, exactly. It has to be good. Um, all right, so I want to I want to get to some of the comments uh, from some of our YouTube uh, comments from uh, from the past couple of weeks because we've been telling you guys that we're going to get back to your comments from the YouTube uh, section for a little while now. So here we go. All right, I got one from M Clark from uh, about two weeks ago. And he says, I know TW hates AEW, LOL. I think as much as AEW has short guys, a lot of impact guys aren't that big. Rick Swan was world champion, dude. He is Darby Allen size. I think you need a mix of big, small, and athletic guys, all shapes and sizes, 
But I think Impact needs to get rid of Mad Fulton and keep Moose as champion for at least six months. All right, M. Clark, thank you for your comment. Now, I have to address this because whenever I talk about uh, people's hero, Adam Cole, baby, uh, or uh, any of the other, you know, the Young Bucks or uh, Darby Allen, you know, any of these guys, People's go-to defense is always, oh, what about short guys? Short guys aren't that bad. Some people are shorter than you think. And I'm like, look, man, I'm not attacking short people. I'm not, I have nothing against short people, okay? Like, this, I'm not, like, anti-short guy. But when it comes to wrestling, when you watch wrestling, you're supposed to feel like you're watching a confrontation. You're supposed to feel like you're watching a fight. You're supposed to root for the good guy. The good guy is supposed to have qualities that you root for. The bad guy is supposed to have qualities that you don't like, that make you want to see this person get punched in their face or get their title taken or get taken down a peg or whatever it is. MJF is short, right? He's like if somebody stuck a pin in EC3, okay? Right, like he's... he's uh, <laughs> Uh, MJF, like physically, there's nothing, you know, wow about MJF, but he's a world-class trash talker, okay? And when you listen to him talk, you want to slap the taste out of his mouth. That's because he's great at his job. You know what I mean? Like he's great at it. And so when I talk about the Adam Coles and the Mizzes and the Young Bucks, it's not because they're short. It's because they're whack. <laughs> it's because they're whack. Like it's not. It's 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 not that you're small. Like Brett, uh, Brian Danielson, he's a, roughly the same size as all those guys, but he's an ass kicker. Okay, right? Like if if Brian Danielson uh, stepped on your girl's foot, you'd be like, oh damn, I gotta fight this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like if Adam Cole <laughs> stepped on your girl's foot, you'd be like, maybe smack that motherfucker, get him out of the way. <laughs> okay, like it's not. <laughs> it's not about being. Uh, it's not about them being short. It's about them not coming off as an intimidating character. If you're supposed to be a bad guy, your number one job is to put the hero in danger, okay? Nothing about Adam Cole or the Young Bucks looks dangerous. So when I see the Young Bucks beating people week after week after week, I'm like, God damn, could you scream wrestling is fake any louder? Okay, like I'm just saying, it is what it is, man. Darby Allen weighs 45 pounds with rocks in his pockets. That coffin drop can't possibly hurt. So, I mean, I'm <laughs> not like, I don't hate AEW. I, I, I like wrestling. Wrestling's fun. But, I, I, but I'm just saying, like, don't, don't try to – if Darby Allen presented like a tough guy, it would be more believable. But he doesn't. He presents like some angry little kid. I'm bad. I'm bad. Now I'm going to throw myself in the wall because you didn't give me what I want. I want my chocolate milk. Like, you know, like it's not like, <laughs> <laughs> is it, you, you get what I'm saying, BQ? I don't hate AEW. I don't hate AEW. And I don't hate short people, okay? There's some beautiful short people in this world, okay? <laughs> but I'm just saying that if you're going to be a wrestler, you're supposed to look like you can beat people up. That's it. Yeah. Um, Coco Beware once said, which was one of my favorite wrestlers when I was a kid, because he's a famous jobber. Um, he said he was okay losing because he's like, I'm smaller than my opponents. He's like a, 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 a good small wrestler should, should be able to beat a decent big guy sometimes, yeah, but a good yeah. small wrestler should never beat a good big wrestler. Right. You know, so he, he just, you know, he, he just talked about that a little bit. Um, and I think right now we see wrestlers, a lot of, uh, a lot of small ones are a lot of s smaller wrestlers are very popular right now. Wrestlers in general are a lot shorter than we think they are because I've talked about this before. I'm five, nine, I'm of average height. I'm, I'm the same height as Brian cage. I think I'm an inch taller than Michael Elgin. You know, and these are big dudes that we don't <laughs> think that when we see them on, on TV. Uh, but they, they take vitamins. Yeah, they do. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> but I took a picture, you know, next to um, Desmond Xavier. I'm a lot taller than he is. Um, so 
it, it's it, wrestlers are smaller than we realize that they are. That they are. It doesn't bother me if a small guy is a champion. It bothers me when someone who's built like a 14-year-old girl is beating people. So, you know, I, I talked about before I've seen Darby Allen in person. I thought he was a kid cosplaying as him. Like, I, and I'm not even start saying that to be funny. Like, he's just this little fragile little thing. I thought it was, I thought it was a child. Like, I was like, oh, wow, he really looks like him. And then he got up close to me. I was like, oh, that's freaking him. Oh, my God. You know, so I, I don't have a issue with someone being smaller but i i think sometimes in wrestling now we're like we got tiny dude like darby allen beat uh billy gunn the other day you know i was and i knew it was gonna happen but it's just kind of like of course of course that's an impossible matchup in real life you know so i just don't like when it's not realistic right Um, right. uh I, i love rich swan He's my top two favorite wrestlers in Impact. I, w- I loved when he was champion. There were some things I wanted him to... to t- like the Rich Swan we get on TV right now is what I wish he kind of was when he was a champion. I think he carries himself better now. I still want him to have fun, but like as a champion, I'm always under the, imp- under the belief that you should become a little bit more serious, which I wanted out of him at the time. But no, we don't have problems with... Smaller wrestlers, we just, I think, we don't like unreal, unrealistic wrestling, right. you know. And my, speaking of which, my other glaring problem with AEW that I bring up all the time is the way they present black wrestlers. I just like, listen, and I'm not talking about in the way, you know, there's no Reverend Slick. There's no Hakeem the African Dream from uh, <laughs> Deepest Darkest Africa. Deepest you know darkest, what I mean? Like, yeah. there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's nothing like that. But, I mean, dog, Max Caster, again, He's got one of the most entertaining acts in AEW. He's one of the biggest, most athletic dudes on their roster, and he can't win a damn match on TV. That is trash, bro. That is trash. Like you. So again, to me, this is more about like that you're catering to a particular fan base that likes to see a particular type of person be on top all the time, and you know, and so so people who look more like athletes are getting pushed in the background. And like, again, it's just trash. It just makes your product look it, 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 like it's missing the, the mark in some respects. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, it is what it is. But yes, but to, to M. Clark, those are my beats for AEW. And they can change those things. You know what I mean? They can change those things. Those things are changeable. So, uh, but uh, again, like if you're a fan of something, you shouldn't look past the things you don't like about it. You should always, no matter what it is, whether it's your favorite sports team, your favorite TV show, your wife's cooking, okay? (laughs) Like, you should talk about the things you don't like because if you don't, they're just going to keep giving you the stuff that you let slide, okay? So remember that, fans. No matter what you're a fan of, hold it accountable. If you think there's something that we do on this show that is trash, call us out about it (laughs) so that we can fix it. Or block you. No, I'm kidding. But just, <laughs> just but for real though, I mean, like, you know, like, like, you know, people get so mad. People rail on like cancel culture, which I think is the trashest thing in the world. People talking about cancel culture. The only people who have really ever been canceled are R. Kelly and Colin Kaepernick. Like nobody's really been canceled. <laughs> Who's been canceled? But people just don't like the idea of of consumers voicing their opinion. You know what I mean? Like the only people you hear complaining about cancel culture are celebrities and idiots who take their cues from celebrities. You know what I mean? Like those, those, those famous people complaining about cancel culture, they just don't want to have to be responsible for their actions. They don't like to be held accountable for the things they do. They want you to just keep showing up and just keep taking whatever they do, no matter what, because they're on TV or they're on Spotify or they're on whatever. Okay. Like, you should complain when people who you support with your time and with your dollars do things you don't approve of. That's what being a consumer is all about. You got to hold people accountable. Am I wrong? No, you're def- definitely not wrong. Uh, what was the other part of that question that he thinks they should get rid of Madman Fulton? Yeah, get rid- he's like, get rid of Madman Fulton. That's and super random. Title for at least six months. Yeah, and who? And what was the last part? Is that Moose should be champion for at least six months. Moose should be a champion forever. Definitely for at least six months. He should be champion forever. Um, he's earned it. 
Madman Fulton, I think there's a lot of talent there. I think where they really missed the ball with him was when he lost to Ken Shamrock at Bound for Glory. Like, that was his, his opportunity to get a big win. Ken Shamrock, Ken Shamrock didn't need the win. He shouldn't have won. There was, they were trying to make a thing out of him when he's not a thing anymore. And it was an opportunity to have Fulton not only beat him, but write him out of the company. Uh, you know, and that would have really solidified him as a, as a monster heel. And I think they did a good job with him when he, they first had him. And then he lost to Tessa Blanchard. And I know it was a uh, DQ finish, but I mean, he still lost to her. The res- record books, which aren't a real thing, but say that he, that he lost to Tessa Blanchard. And then OVE went on an insane losing streak to Tessa, and then period. And then they break him off from OVE. Um, Sammy Callahan attacks them. OVE never gets any kind of comeuppance whatsoever. They don't, that it's next week, they don't go looking for Sammy. They don't jump at nothing. They just take an ass whooping. They take an L and then move on. And then he just goes right back to being a flunky again for Ace Austin, who's not right. getting wins. So it's, it's the position they put him in. I think he could be, uh, now he's talking a little bit. So I think he could be something, but it's like, I, I just felt that that Ken Shamrock match, that was the opportunity. He had a high profile mm-hmm. singles match. Establish him as a monster, no, and and the dude loses every time he wrestles. So, yeah, I don't think it's his fault by any means, but uh, mm-hmm. I'd probably be looking to move on if I were. I will say this though: they they've never done anything with Batman Fulton, but people remember this is wrestling. It takes nothing to heat somebody up. It really doesn't. Batman Fulton can start killing people on TV next week, and within a month, you'll be looking at him like a title contender. It is what it is. This is a TV show. All, you're just conditioned to seeing him lose, and you're like, ah, what's the point? All they got to do is recondition you, okay? Yeah. That's it. All they got to do is recondition you. They cut some promos of him, you know, working out to Eye of the Tiger or something, and, you know, coming back bigger and meaner than ever, have him kick Morrissey in the face, you know, you know, a few things. Like, listen, it takes nothing, because at the end of the day, that dude is still big as hell, and he still looks like he could hurt you in real life. And again, like, this is what I say when we were talking about, you know, wrestlers being believable or not being believable. It will always look believable that a guy who looks like Madman Fulton could terrorize you. And so mm-hmm. as long as he looks like that, all you got to do is heat him up. It takes nothing. It really takes nothing. Yeah. I remember sitting here ranting on this show about how the hell they expect us to care about Rohit Raju. And a month later, he was the exhibition champion. Okay? Right. Like, it. It's nothing. All, all, just, listen, just, you just got to see him win. So be patient and just remember, like, just remember this is a TV show. It's a TV show. Nobody's ever, you know, useless or done or irreparable or, you know what I mean? Like, it's a TV show. It's got to create some sort of scenario that changes the way you look at stuff. So, yeah, that's that. All right, let's see. Um, all right, here's an interesting question from Bland Skies 28 says, since this Impact Plus show will be live, they need a couple of debuts and not some old WCW has been <laughs> and who nobody knows. As far as this week's show, the most interesting thing was Martinez and Mickey Feud. Other than that, just not that interesting. All right, um, that was actually the wrong comment I meant to read. Um, but <laughs> I don't necessarily uh, disagree with, disagree with that. Uh, but Turning Point turned out to be a pretty good show. So, you know, they, they figured that out. Um, and there was a very interesting debut at Turning yeah. Point. So, you know, so I guess you were right, Blance Guys 28. Um, the comment that I actually meant to read was from Mark Mello, who said, I just realized that Turning Point was at 10 p.m. again. Like, why? Do they not want the most amount of people watching live? And I think that was a fair question. But I would say this. When I turned on Turning Point and realized it was live and in Vegas where they were taping it, it was seven o'clock. Right, right. Seven o'clock in Vegas. So think about that. If they were to put that show on at eight o'clock East Coast time, then it would have been five o'clock in Vegas. You got a much better chance of getting a good hot crowd for a seven o'clock show than you do for a five o'clock show. So uh, it it turned out to be the right move. 
And the most of us, like, let's be honest. If you're watching Impact at this point, you are a diehard. You're a member of the Impact Faithful. (laughs) And so so as a member of the Impact Faithful, you're going to find the show. You're probably going to wait till 10 o'clock to watch it. Honestly, I thought the show was on earlier, too. I turned it on around 10 o'clock just to try and catch the end of it. And it was the beginning of it. And I was like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, um, so listen, like I said, if you're an Impact fan at this point, you're probably going to find the show. And if you don't find it when it's on live, you'll come back and catch it, you know, because it's available on YouTube, basically on demand. So I don't think that was a bad move. And like I said, when I heard that crowd, oh, it felt amazing to hear a good yeah. live crowd at an Impact show. And so, um, yeah, so putting the show at 10 o'clock, that was actually a great move. But the reason why is because it was in Vegas and that was a, a more of a normal time for them. I've always felt that even with the one night only shows, so I'm going back a little bit. I've always felt that the monthly, I'm going to say a monthly special because they've always done some kind of monthly show. I always felt like the acoustics and the audience was louder. I, I don't know what it is compared to the, the television show. I don't know if when they, when they edit the show and they cut it and they mix it down, if they compress the shit out of it in a way that they, they, they're they able to use a much more raw file when they're doing the monthly specials, I don't I don't know what it is, but they just always sound way better. I don't I don't know what it is, but Turning Point was um it was what Bound for Glory should have been, probably. Turning Point was a little long in my opinion. By the time it got to the main event, I was I was like I I was barely tuned to like following what was going on because I, at that point I just started getting bored because it was just two. I mean, it's like three and a half hours. Yeah. These yeah. monthly specials, two hours folks, like what, what yeah. the hell, what are you doing? Totally agree. Two hours, like a TV show, maybe two and a half hours. Like do not take it to th- three hours. You don't have the roster to be doing a three hour show like that every month because I mean, it, the roster is growing. Don't get me wrong, but it's, I still don't think you have the roster to put on that much wrestling content. Because then we're going to start watching the same match right. over and over. Dude, I got to say this, man. I cannot believe the Good Brothers won again. <laughs> like, are, they are just a gift that keeps on giving. I, I, they've cooled off the Bullet Club so much. Yeah. At this point, you know, they've had multiple chances at the title. So even if they do win here, I mean, it's going to be, there's going to be no real pop for it. There's going to be no excitement for it. The, that and we've been watching the same three teams fight over and over. I'm, I bet when Impact comes back on the air next week, we're going to see some kind of iteration of Finn Juice, Good Brothers, and Bullet Club in one way or another fighting each other. Yeah, I don't yeah. know for sure what the card is, but I I just couldn't believe. I was like, "There's no way the Bullet Club loses. <laughs> no yeah. way." Yeah. Um. I, I do. I want to. I want to actually just throw one more thing on, like what you said about having the three hour shows, I get trying to create value and they are creating some sort of value, but I really think they need to adopt the takeover method, which is again, give me five bust ass matches, five balls to the wall matches that is going to have the whole internet talking the next day. Give me five of those. And listen, like, I know that again, like wrestling is scripted or whatever, but I do think there's something to this idea of if you only got five or six matches on a show, I think that creates more competition amongst the performers to need to be the one you have on the show. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's going to get more out of, out of people when they, whenever they hit your camera, they got to make sure that they are capitalizing on that time. And so like, I would love for impact to adopt the takeover format where, like you said, you're, you're giving me five or six matches at the most of just balls to the wall, bust ass matches that, you know, is two, two and a half hours tops. And you are just exhausted after it's done. You feel like you ran a marathon watching all these matches go back and forth. And I think that's a great way. I mean, I don't think there's been, I didn't see every takeover during the takeover era, but I saw most of them and they were all damn good. You know what I mean? They were, all the ones I saw were freaking damn good. And so I just think it's a, it's a great format to use, man. Like build to 
four or five bust ass matches and just deliver a, a satisfied audience. And um, and then you keep going, you know, you keep going back at your next show. You know, to me, I don't think it's a hard format. I agree with you 100%. Uh, let's see what else we got here from the comment section. Mm -hmm. So we had some comments from the episode we did about the recent WWE releases. And let's see. TR5003 says, I have my fingers crossed for Mia Yim, slash Mia Yim or Jade, Taya Valkyrie and Scarlet, if Cross let her come back. Interesting. Um, <laughs> they were awesome in Impact. They will, they will really help build the knockouts division. I also want Impact to sign Ember Moon as well. Ember Moon will make a great addition to the knockouts division, and they definitely need to sign Keith Lee. He would be awesome. WWE really dropped the ball with him big time. This is the time for Impact to really step up now and being lazy and stop talking everybody's, taking everybody so lightly. Lightly. Okay. Uh, time out for waiting after 90 days. Impact needs to reach out to now before AJ is right. Okay, all right, I got, I got it. Thanks for the comment. Um, so this is back to back to the releases that we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, look, I think all those names would actually be really good. I'd love to see Ty Bakri come back to Impact. I mean, I can totally see her going to AEW just because you know she's a star, man. Ty is a star, and she deserves the biggest platform she can be on. Um. You know, and I think AEW's women's division is presented a little more sport-like. And so, like, there's there's less less character stuff. Um, it's it's more sport-like. I think Taya would thrive in that environment. And then she would add the character piece. I think Taya would be amazing in AEW because she just is. She's just dope in every aspect of the wrestling business. Um, Ember Moon, I was never really crazy about Ember Moon. But, uh, I, I mean, like, you know whatever. If they wanted to add her, I think anybody who you can add to help out the knockout division, I'm a big fan of. Um, medium, great wrestler. Um, AEW can't sign everybody. You know, AEW can't sign everybody. But so far they are. Great opportunities for Impact to scoop up some of these people, even if it's only for a few episodes. And with them doing the block tapings, you know, bringing somebody to work, you know, six weeks of TV leading up to a pay-per-view. I think that's a great thing, you know what I mean, and 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 do it that way. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities out there, but yeah, I think they should definitely sign some of those people. Keith Lee, listen, Keith Lee and Moose, I'd be down to see that. I think that'd be a cash money match for pay per view. Um, you know whether or not they could promote it right is anybody's guess, but um, but I would love to see Keith Lee and Moose, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a match for the world title. I personally don't think. I know it's to sound really negative. I don't think they have a shot at any of those names. Mm -hmm. Mia Yi, Mia Yi, Mia Yim, possibly. She has a good history with the company. I don't think she is as hot of a name as she she probably could have been. What what makes her a hotter name is that she's attached to Keith Lee, and that's it. Like she didn't do anything on the main roster in WWE. Uh, she was primed for to be. For the big time, I say the big time, but as big time as you could be in TNA, they were getting ready to like really, really push her. You know, she had been teasing the 450 splash for a while, and then all of a sudden she was just out of the company. Uh, I thought they think, I mean, I think they thought <laughs> she was going to take over the Gail Kim position um, in the knockouts division. That, that's where I feel like they were, were trying to go with her. But I don't think they have a shot at those guys. And, and the reason I say that is that AW can't sign anyone, but everyone who has that cool factor, if you will, AW seems to gobble up. <laughs> if they, you know, every time they release someone and they've, they've just got that, like, that cool, we got a, our own fan base, you know, yeah. they, they grab those guys. That, that's just what they do. So, you know, I, I had told some people on Facebook, well, I, I think those releases, a lot of those recent releases are too cool for Impact. I don't, I don't mean 
that's too cool for impact. I just mean that those type of wrestlers, um, AEW grabs. So I, I just, I couldn't imagine them letting Keith Lee <laughs> slip through their fingers. I, I just, I just can't. Um, as far as Taya Valkyrie, I would love to see her back, but I think she's done everything she could do with impact. That doesn't mean there can't be a good program with Deanna Perrazzo. There's always mm-hmm. stuff there with Bravo and Rosemary that she can revisit. She could, um, they had her doing some intergender stuff uh, towards the end that I thought she really thrived in because she has a history of doing that. So, you know, I, I thought it looked really natural, uh, especially because she's a she's a bigger, a taller gal. But she was she was with the company for a long time. I mean, she was when they were like Global Force Wrestling. You know what I mean? Like, you, just right even right before that. So she she'd been there for a while. I think she got a taste of the big time a little bit with NXT. I just can't imagine she'd be like, oh, let, let me go back to Impact. I just feel like when you're in that position, you're like, yo, I, I want to prove these people wrong. I think I can take my career to this level. I just can't see her coming back. I could see her maybe for a little bit, but I don't think long term. I, I just don't see it. Um, I don't remember some of those other names there, but I feel like that list that you read off, I just I don't expect to see any of them yeah. personally. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, only time will tell. Um, you know, these releases happened a couple of weeks ago. They got, you know, either 60 or 90 days of, of non-compete, which means they can sit home and get paid, get themselves in their best possible shape, get healthy, heal up any bumps and bruises, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and choose where they want to go. Listen, the landscape can change quickly. Um, you know, AEW is really hot on a few guys right now in 90 days. Will that be the case? Maybe, maybe not. So, you know, you never know. Uh, You know, there's always, if there's one thing about, you know, opportunity, opportunity doesn't sit still, you know, it's, it's always rotating. It's not always going to be in the same place, um, but it'll always be there. And so as long as, you know, people just stay on their grind, keep pushing, keep, you know, uh, creating quality content, um, I don't know if you guys have seen AJ Francis, the former top dollar, but he's been putting a lot of, I think, good fun content out on social media. And I think that, you know, when his when his 90 day non-compete is up, I think that he's going to, you know, he's going to do really well somewhere. Um, again, people like AJ Francis and, um, and, and Keith Lee, they don't exactly fit the package of what AEW likes to sell. So that could put them an impact. You know what I mean? I don't know. We'll see. So uh, anything can happen. But, you know, listen, I, I'm I'm down for the good matchups. I'm here for good TV. Give it to me. All right. Let's see. Um, oh, <laughs> let's see. Packed Entertainment actually said, I don't want Taya Vaccari, uh slash Frankie Monet back, to be honest. She left and didn't look back. I know she left on good terms, but she wanted to leave. So Impact shouldn't let her stay, uh, should let her stay elsewhere and go find work elsewhere. All right, this is trash. Um, <laughs> like, bro, you can never blame somebody for taking a bigger payday somewhere else. Like if, if somebody offered you more money to do the same job on a bigger platform, that's going to eventually turn into more money for you again, and you wouldn't take it because you're loyal to the company you work for, then you a damn fool. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. You know, like, I'm going to keep working for XYZ company because they hired me first. Uh, no, I'm going to go to ABC company where I'm going to make more money. And then I can come back to XYZ company and demand more money because I worked for ABC company. So, I mean, this whole idea that wrestlers should be loyal to their employer, just think of it like how you would think of it if it was your job. You know what I mean? If it was yeah. your job, you wouldn't take less money to stay there when you have a chance to make more money and be on a bigger platform, you know, doing the same thing. This is, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm, I'm super happy with my job and there was a, I actually applied for a different one that paid me a little less, but I heard people are a lot happier there than they are at my job. So part of me was like, man, do I, you know, so I want to take a little bit less and go to what looks like a better environment. And I was like, no, I'm, I like what I make. And I just, I just stuck with that. 
money is 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 a more of a motivating motivating factor than I think a lot of impact fans want to pretend that it is. You know, they want to see a lot of loyalty. The company we want to see loyalty, yes, but people are going to go where the money is at the at right, the end right. of the day. I think the people at the top of the impact card are very happy with what they make. You know, but uh, there, there's a lot of people on paper appearance deals that. Um, get a lot more bookings now because of it, and that's helped them financially. But you know, the people at the bottom of the card are not getting rich. You know what I mean? So right, right. Uh, there's, there's people are going to chase opportunity if it if it's right for them. You know? Yeah. Um. So we had another one here from from Sam from Trinidad. He said he'd love to see Killer Cross back, but as a face. Uh, he said he looks like he could be the next Stone Cold. What do you think about that one? I, I never wanted him to lose Cross. I thought that was really, really ugly. Uh, but I think he also unfairly, my opinion, was asking for a pay raise that he didn't earn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, he admitted, you know, I was a relative unknown prior to Impact. The problem was he found out what Johnny Impact and some of these guys were making. And he said, oh, wait. If we got money like that, well, I want I want that. That was what the problem was, and that's why you don't just when you're in a job like that, you don't discuss what you make. Like, so my fiance is a nurse. I know for a fact she makes more than her coworkers because she mm-hmm. moved here from California to where they pay people more. So when she came here, she's kind of like, "This is what I make. This is what I made. Uh, I need to make that," and they pay her that, and it was above the wage that they offered her. But if she were to tell that to her coworkers, yo, I probably make like four bucks an hour more than you do, we'd have there would be an issue. So I think pay needs to be extremely close to the chest. I think Cross found out what some guys were making, probably shouldn't have. And and that caused, you know, a big shit storm. Right. He would be I actually think he's better off just returning to impact than going to AEW. I don't think I don't think they're on good enough terms to return. Yeah. He's got so much talent, but in AEW he would 100% get lost in the shuffle. They don't have a clue what to do with bigger wrestlers. Not a clue in 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 hell. Um, right, and he's bigger and he's not flippy. Like Keith right. Lee is bigger but he's also flippy. So Keith Lee right. can survive in AEW. But right. a guy like Cross uh, again, especially after what Adam Cole did to him in that promo on NXT, he might have to beat Adam Cole's ass backstage just off general principle. Like, <laughs> he never looked the same after that promo against Adam Cole on NXT. Like, that was just rough. That was rough. So he should stay far away from anything involving Adam Cole in a live microphone. So, yes. If he just decides, hey, I want them to pay me, uh, you know, because I just use the example myself. If, they, if he's just like, hey, I want to go here because I'll make more, then he might do it. But his ceiling is somewhere above Lance Archer and below Malachi Black. You, you know, so is that a, a spot he wants on the card? Right. Probably right. never hold a championship. You know, uh, Impact could do a lot with him. They spent a lot of time building up Scarlet a lot. That was one of the slowest builds of anything, and then she's gone. Poof. Right. So I think they, they, they would both thrive if they came back. They could both really use them, or they could use both of them. I mean, I don't think we'll see them return, though. I'd, I'd be pretty shocked. So I, I got one for you, BQ. Yeah. Um, out of between, you know, ROH shutting down or going on hiatus and, uh, and impact, uh, I'm sorry, and, and WWE, you know, releasing people like, you know, uh, like I do gas after Taco Tuesday. Um, <laughs> give me four, three or four names that you would love to see show up in Impact and how who you would pair them with right away. Who do you mean pair them with? So like, for example, I would love to see, I'd love to see Keith Lee. I mentioned earlier, I'd love to see Keith Lee show up in Impact and I like to see him work with Moose right away. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Ooh, interesting. Um, 
so we got several free agents out there. Um, so I'm going to start with EC3. I, I want to see EC3 return. When he came back this second time, he didn't feel like you just knew he wasn't sticking around. Like it didn't feel like EC3 of old in any stretch, any any by any stretch of the imagination. Did it feel like that? I would like to see him return, uh, without the cheesy, you know, promos and talking over the loud, ominous tones and and <laughs> crap like that. I would like to see him return, but I want to see him re- return to work with Moose again uh because there's a story there that could really progress that uh f- from last time um and I, I think we they didn't tap into what ec3 was he didn't have any other matches with anybody uh i don't think he would necessarily do super well at aew i wouldn't be surprised if he didn't want to test the waters there mm-hmm. but um I think he would have went there the first time if it was if it was a realistic option for him, but he chose to go to Ring of Honor. So I actually really really want to see him return, uh, and and push. You know, he brought up Cross possibly being a Stone Cold character. Like EC3 should be sh- should have been the top guy, and it should have never lost that spot. The problem was they allowed him to lose the spot, and then he couldn't get it back. And the biggest mistake they made with him, I used the example of Fulton earlier, the biggest mistake they made is when he took on Lashley at Bound for Glory in 2016, whatever it was, 15, and lost. And because Lashley had his very dominant reign, EC3 hadn't been champion for a while. He was. They spent a good almost a year building him as a baby face. And that was just the perfect opportunity for him to regain the title. Like he shouldn't, he, I, I liked Lashley as a champion, as a long dominant champion. But if, if you remember that match started with, uh, during introductions, when he, when he was saying, and the challenger, Lashley just speared him out of the ring, like a <laughs> piece of garbage. That's what you do to someone who's going to win the match. Who's going to get their come up and he speared him out like a piece of trash to start the match, speared him like a piece of trash to end the match, and then after that, they're like, we can't keep EC, EC3 at the top of the card now. We can't just keep having a fight with Lashley. Um, if he won the title, they could have extended the program with Lashley, and then if he lost it, they could have still found a way to keep him at the top. But that was, as a baby face, he was going up, 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 had that match lost, and it was downhill from there. They were never never able to recapture the magic with him. Uh, I just think he just needs to come back. So that was a really long answer for that one. Um, you know, some of these Ring of Honor names. I, I knew Lethal wasn't coming. The mm-hmm. Briscoes, I highly doubt are coming. Uh, they need the Briscoes badly, uh, but I, I don't think they're going there. Um, Man, it's hard to say who I how, who I would put them against. I think uh, Dalton Castle is someone that would be a a really good um, pickup for them. Again, I don't know that he would necessarily thrive in AEW. Uh, I think he would be a a really good um, addition. I would like to see him against someone like an Ace Austin or something like that. I think that'd be like a good way to start with him. Uh, what about the females? What are, what are some of the girls have been released here recently? Um, so it's uh, coming out of the ROH deals. Um, there's Mandy Leon, um, Angelina Love. Uh, I'm not sure. I think Velvet Sky may have retired. Um, no, she's she's in NWA ruining the commentary. Uh, um, no, you know what? I'm gonna I'll stop you right there. So actually, Angelina Love and Bully Ray pulls you into a a back room at ROH. No, they broke up. <laughs> oh, did they? they? Yeah, last week. Oh, oh, how'd you know this? Yeah. Because it's all over social media. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> that's the. La- I mean, that's terrible. And you know what's so funny is, I saw her tweet something a few uh, days ago that said something like, "You should still try to date your girl like you're pursuing her" or something like that. And I yeah. was like, "That's interesting, coming from somebody who public is in a very public." 
long-term relationship. And I, I've always been like, you don't do that. You, you don't, keep, no. you don't subtweet your spouse in public You or, or, or your significant other in public. Like you don't do that. And you don't put private information out on public platforms. Like just, you just don't do that. Like just as a matter of respecting one another's privacy and the concept of having a personal life. I just don't think you do that. I'm not even talking about like them specifically or for celebrities. I just mean for people. You know what I mean? Like if 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 my wife and I had like a personal disagreement, I would never jump into her comments on social media and talk about it. I'm like, yo, what? Like that's that's sloppy and stupid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I I I to me that's just stupid. But yeah, that's crazy. I didn't know that's uh man. So were they like posting about was she like, yeah, I'm single now. What's up? It, it was just they they both posted that they amic you know amicably split. Oh. you know, on good terms, whatever. So <laughs> Velvet Sky is hot, but I mean, I, I've met her once in person and she doesn't, she doesn't have much of a personality. I'm not saying she's, she's, I'm not, I just mean she's, maybe as not much of a personality is a good thing to say because I, I don't want to talk bad about her. I think she's kind of shy. She's not very talkative. Like she's, you know, like doing the meet and greets and stuff. Like she's she's it says the minimum words to you. She's fr- right, She's right. nice, but she's not like friendly. Like she's not over. You know. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know, but um, I'd actually love to see the Allure show up. Would love to see them show up. I think they fit the uh, knockouts division, tag team division, perfect. I think they would just really blend in well with um the inspiration and the uh, influence. And we'd actually have three teams that were in the mold of the uh, beautiful people a little bit, especially because I guess two or three, two of the three or four girls would be there. But um, I do think, I, I do think the Impact's Knockout Division is miss, it, it has for a long time been missing that kind of knockout, and we're starting to get it a little bit more. Um, but I, but I, I would love to see him show up. The first time I ever saw Mandy Leone, I was like, yo, that is a freaking star right there. Mm-hmm. Um, it just has to be on the right platform. But I've always thought that about her, just as, as whether just the way she looks, the way she wrestles. I think she's she's freaking excellent. So, And then uh, I, I guess a fourth name. Oh, da, 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 da. crap. I'm trying to think of what some of these other um, releases are. Whew. I don't know. Mia Yim. We talked about Taya Valkyrie. And I'm going to throw Mia Yim in there, actually, because I I, I think I want to see her take uh, care of unfinished business with Impact. Like, as I said, I think they were trying to get her into that Gail Kim spot uh, when Gail Kim was leaving, but then she she publicly said, "I would love to go do NXT and go." You know, she didn't resign because she wanted to get in the May Young Classic. She wanted to have the opportunity to do it, which you right. know, she did. Right. Um, but I think her showing up as a baby face kind of out of, out of nowhere and um, going at it with Deanna Perrazzo would just be excellent. Yeah, that could be very good. All right, let's see what we got here. A couple more. In Baldwin 45 says, Marcus question for the Q&A. Who would you guys say are the five physically strongest wrestlers in Impact? I saw a shoot interview with Jordan Grace where she said she wasn't close to being the strongest wrestler there despite having won powerlifting meets. Who are your picks? All right, I'll go first. Five, the five physically strongest wrestlers in Impact. I'm going to say Moose would be number one, probably. Um, Morrissey, I'm sure he takes his vitamins, but I'm sure he's pretty strong. Um, (laughs) Let's see, who else? Who else? Who, Who else? You know, EY is a workout maniac. I bet he's somewhere up there among the strongest wrestlers in Impact. Um, Rhino is probably one of the stronger wrestlers in Impact. And Joe Doring is probably strong as a mother. Joe Doring is probably strong as hell. I was going to say Luke Gallows is probably also strong as hell, too. So that was six. So those those would be my five. If you had to pick five, who would you think? So so I'm gonna th- I'm gonna say Joe Doring. Like he he looks like he's legitimately very 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 strong. Um, I think uh, 
Black Taurus is a very strong guy. Um, I have to throw Jordan Grace in there. Was it not including the knockouts? Is that what he was saying? Or no, I didn't say not including the knockouts. No, I, I would 100% throw that throw her in there. Um, I would say probably Fulton. I'll go with Madman Fulton and then Moose. Sure, I forgot about Fulton. Yeah. So let me say something here. Uh, they announced this Ultimate X match for the knockouts. Mm-hmm. My first thought, which I think is a great idea that they're doing it, I love when they're innovative because that's what – you know, Scott said, oh, we're, we're allowed to be ahead of the curve here. I always think they're behind the curve on just about everything. But the good days of TNA was very ahead of the curve. I just right, don't think right. in the last four years they have been. I think they've been very reactionary for the most part. Uh, so I thought this was an opportunity to really do something to get people talking. So I'm, I'm very excited for it. But my first thought was, I don't know that the women have the upper body strength to, to do Ultimate X. Now, they know better than me, otherwise they wouldn't have booked the match. Um, I had someone on Facebook tell me, well, what's the difference with them doing it and the guys doing it? Or, or something like that. What, you know, try to, almost like I was being sexist. Like, well, if the guys can do it, the girls can't. Women have, it's a genetic fact that they have 50% less upper body strength than men. Uh, the lower body strength is the same for the most part. I think a lot of women are actually stronger but the upper body strength, that's just a fact. That's not me being sexist or anything like that. So I, I really just wonder, uh, and because also women's center of gravity is completely different uh, than what a, ma- what a man's is. So I just, I, I'm really curious to see how this plays out. But do you have any concerns about how this match could play out? Because we're talking about strong, they have to be strong. It has to be Mercedes Martinez. It has to be, you probably got to try to get Jordan Gracie in, the, in there, even though she has the the nothing title. Um, Ellering could do it, I'm sure. There, there's a couple strong girls in there, but dude, but it's not one of those matches they could just throw anyone like like the inspiration couldn't do it. Madison Rain couldn't do it, you know. Like, right. you know, do you have any concerns about how this might? Uh, no, I I don't have any concerns about it at all. I think you might have to get creative, and I think you got to understand that it probably won't look the same. Um, but it can still be very good. I mean, there's different ways to do these things. If you think about um, <clears throat> one of my favorite ladder matches uh, was the Rock versus Triple H in SummerSlam from, I think it's like 1998 or 1999. And <clears throat> you know how many flips they did off that ladder? Zero. You know how many <laughs> Spanish flies they did off the ladder? Zero. Okay, you know how many swantons they did off the ladder? Zero. Okay, like you, there's different ways to do stuff. Okay, like, you know, like things of the, at some point, people decided that if you want to have ladder matches or things like that, it has to involve tons of flippy stuff. I like, but listen, man, there's, there's multiple ways to do it. And honestly, I think that it will only add to the intrigue if you don't see people uh, that can do it the same way that you are used to seeing it done. So uh, what, one thing we do know about Jordan Grace, she's a phenomenal athlete. You can't convince her she can't climb a rope. You know what I mean? And I, I, I think she probably does have the upper body strength to, to do that. I think she definitely does. I think Tasha still, she's very light. Um, uh, she also looks like she's in great great shape. Uh, I, I'll, I would bet you anything Chelsea Green does. Um, uh, Madison yeah. Rain probably does. Um, but everybody's different. You know what I mean? Everybody's different. I think you can find ways to do it. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know about Mercedes Martinez, but there's different, again, she could climb, she could climb the the scaffolding and, and do the thing where she tries to inch her way across, you know, like, listen, there's ways to do stuff. So there definitely will be intrigue as to exactly how this is going to look. And listen, it's some of it is just not going to be look going to look the same way as when the men do it. I remember, oh my God, uh, it was it was an episode of Dynamite or Rampage, and Britt Baker and somebody were trying to go through a table and they just couldn't get the table to break. And it was I uh was crying watching that. I'm like, dog, like just let it go. And I think that happened to Sasha Banks and Charlotte once too. So like 
you know, look, man, you know, you, you're basing your plan for this match off of a model of guys who are three times heavier than you. And so the physics of things like breaking a table, you know, they're used to going a certain way. So we just, they got to see what works. You know, they got to take some time and, you know, try to get in the lab a little bit and see if they can, you know, work on these spots and just figure out a way to make it work. But, you know, I'm interested. I'm intrigued. I I don't know how it's going to go. If nothing else, they're going to give you something you've never seen before. And... And, and, and that alone is something to tune in for. So I, I'm here for it 100%. I don't have concerns about, you know, whether or not someone's going to hurt themselves. I hope not. You know what I mean? But yeah. that's, listen, that's wrestling. That's wrestling. You know what I mean? Like, you, you, you go to do a simple spot with a baseball bat in a chair. Next thing you know, somebody's laying on the mat with their face busted. So, you know, like, yeah. anything is possible. It was uh, Burt Baker and Abaddon is the match you're thinking of. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Kind of thing. I think they could climb the scaffold. It's the rope that was my concern. But I think that as long as their legs are wrapped around it, I think they could do it. Actually, my what I was thinking in my head was hanging, you know, uh, just hanging by your arms and you know, shimming across. I, I just I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I think if they wrap their legs around the rope and they and they drag themselves like you know the guys tend to do sometimes, I think it could definitely work. But yeah. I don't, I just don't think there's going to be a lot of spots because I, um, I think there's there's going to be time where they're where they're trying to get to the X or whatever they have. But I I, I can't imagine it's going to have the spots that a men men's match would have. I think it'll be for the most part a normal wrestling match. I have to believe it, but yeah, I don't know. But I'm excited, yeah, super I think excited. That's okay. Right. Give yeah. me give me a bust ass match where, you know, it's not about the spots, but it's about trying to incapacitate people so you can get to so you can have enough time to try and climb the ladder. You know, what I mean? oh, not climb the ladder, but climb the scaffolding and then scale across the rope, you know. So I, yeah. I, I, I'm a fan. I, I like it. I, give me the entry, you know, you know, show me them trying to figure out a way to navigate a situation that they haven't seen before. I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, definitely. All right. Critical Sting says, mailbag question. Which impact talent that left to go to AEW has surprised you the most with how they've been booked, whether it be good or bad? Uh, and he lists Ali, Santana Ortiz, Ethan Page, Kiera Hogan, etc. cetera. Ooh, gosh, there's... There's a lot of good and bad in there. Um, if you take someone like Ali, uh, Impact booked her a lot better, a lot better. But I like her AEW presentation a lot more. Uh, when she was a part of the, it was very short lived. The Nightmare Sisters with Brandy Rhodes, mm-hmm. that was the Ali that I think people wanted to see, where she was a, she wasn't a baby face. She was a heel, and then she was Brandy was a baby face. So it was like an interesting dynamic, but um, that confident alley, I think, would have been a star in Impact. Um, now she's just a, a jobber, but uh, they don't use her enough for me to really throw her in there. I, I think the biggest shocking one to me, the one that's most shocking to me, is Brian Cage. You know, he came in full of piss and vinegar. He was a number one contender for the world title immediately. Uh, I I was even questioning could he win the world title and he's not anywhere near that you know they gave him the fcw title for a while um you know he's lost to ricky starks he he, you know he had a nice win against a clean win against hangman adam page but they haven't done dick with him um i think ethan page i hate him in aew uh, like where i legitimately don't like him but they've done a good job with him mm-hmm. as far as just he just kind of feels like a big deal and like impact got made him feel like a big deal too but it took a while to get him there you know i think the the pay the pairing with scorpio sky is very good um but if they had i can't think of anyone that like has necessarily exceeded my expectations it's good to see santana and ortiz 
get shine on a bigger stage, they're not having the matches they were in Impact right. at all. Uh, Lucha Brothers aren't having the matches they were in Impact. So, um, Kiera Hogan is already lost in the shuffle. Uh, fortunately, they allow her to do NWA um, right. still. So that's, you know, she's even said that in an interview, like, at least I'm able to do that still because they don't do anything with her. But I can't say there's someone that I'm like, man, they have exceeded expectations since going there. Um, I, I don't know. The Speaking of Alia, the Blade is probably... He's still a jobber in AEW, but he's he was like just a dude in Impact. I mean, they had no clue right, what to yeah. do with him. And once he got interesting, they let him go. Uh, so his current gimmick is a lot better than what he was doing in Impact, but uh, but still pretty much jobbing. So I don't know. I, I can't think of anyone that's exceeding expectations over there. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say if anybody, I'd have to give it to Bri- um, Brian Cage. <laughs> <laughs> <Get you. laughs> that was a slip. I don't know. That was yeah. a pretty slip. What um, what I was gonna say, if anybody, I'd have to give it to Ethan Page. Ethan Page. Yeah. And the reason why is because this, even though they haven't necessarily given him a ton of big spots, although working with Chris Jericho is that is a big spot, but he still feels like somebody when you see him on AEW TV where you can look at him and go, man, if they just gave that guy more time, he could be a big deal. Yeah. And I, yeah. and everything about Ethan Page screams star. He got his body in the best shape possible since uh, while he was coming towards the end of his impact deal. And if you see him, he's still in great shape. And again, and he can talk so well that he doesn't have to wrestle so much. He doesn't yeah. have to be, you know, putting out a match every week on TV. He can cut a promo and keep himself interesting. And so I, I think he's probably the person that's going from impact to AEW that appears to have the most promise. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Because you, if you remember an impact, he was fat at one point. Mm-hmm. You know, remember he got in that Twitter beef with a uh, Twitter beef, but Twitter spat with Ricochet because Ricochet made a fat joke at him. <laughs> I didn't remember and, that. And no, he like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was bad. And R- Ricochet thought they were cool when he was making it, you know, but he got... Uh, Ethan Page got really mad, so I, I would have to agree with you on that. I cannot think of anyone that that has jumped ship that has, with the exception of they ha- them having a bigger brand now. I can't think of anyone who's really benefited. You know, well, it matter, Mar- like, you think of like Ali, right? Like Ali was at in in Impact during the time when like the checks where it was a question if the check was going clear. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's like yo. There's times when, you know, we all be at our job and we're like, ah, whoo, as long as that direct deposit hits. And there was times while Ellie was an impact where it was questionable if not the direct deposit was going to hit. So, um, so I don't blame her at all for taking a bigger platform and a bigger paycheck. Um, and, you know, look, impact, I think impact had a plan with her when they first started, when they grabbed her and Rosemary and they just never quite got to it. Yeah, you know? they never got there. They just never, they never quite got there. And so, you know, I can't fault her at all for moving on. No. All right. We're down to our last three. You ready? Yep. All right. So Luke Avery says, this is a good one. You got to put your thinking hat on for this one. Okay. Who would you consider your Mount Rushmore of the knockouts division? Past, present, or both? Interesting. So Let me go obvious. First. Let me go first. Okay. Yeah, please do. So my Mount Rushmore of the knockouts division will be Gail Kim, Awesome Kong, Mm -hmm. Madison Rain, and that fourth one is tough, man. That fourth one is tough. Yeah. Oh. I, I, that fourth one is tough, but I am going to give the fourth spot on the knockouts Mount Rushmore to Mickey James. Ooh, so, yeah, that's that. So Gail Kim, uh, awesome Kong almost said Tessa Blanchard. All right. So I'll go <laughs> Gail Kim, 
Awesome Kong, uh, Madison Rain, and Mickey James. That's my four. It's hard to disagree with that. Um, I would say... I'm going to say the same four. Uh, so, but for the sake of being a little bit different, the names that I would say are on the bubble, uh, I would put Angelina Love in there. Um, I would put, uh, personally, I would put Taryn Terrell in there. Um, and then I do think Taya Valkyrie and Deanna Perrazzo belong, deserve to be in the, conversation I, I really do uh because i think they just their their knockouts title reigns have been excellent um and then the last one i'm going to throw in the conversation is rosemary because she's um because of how over she is because of her loyalty to the company you know you don't get the vibe like oh rosemary's out of here when that contract's up like you don't get that from her um i just i'm shocked that she doesn't have more than one knockouts title run that's just wow. insane to me i know she just recently won the knockouts titles and that was just a tra- as a transitional champion so uh i, I don't really like what Be- decay has become <laughs> mm-hmm. I-, I i like the four wrestlers i just don't like yeah. the quite where that what they've morphed into but um she's gonna go down as one of the most popular ones ever yeah you yeah. know so you know those are just ones i would put on the bubble but i i would have to agree with yeah. Uh, with what you just said that's why you know that's why when they had this madison rain and diana perrazzo match i'm like that that's why i wanted them to build something i was like you're never going to have a match like this again uh, of two former knockouts champ you know i mean well mickey was a current champion that particular match you know they've been dying to have matches with you know legitimate nostalgia not um you know, some of the people they bring in, they try to make you seem like you give a shit, like ODB or something like that. But um, this just deserves something like to build, to make it special. And it, they just treat it as like, hey, next week on Impact, these two are fighting. Yeah. You know, but um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of good women out there to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. And no, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, you got to, you know, um, it, ending of her run notwithstanding you got to consider tessa blanchard um yeah. you know um you got to consider taya valkyrie taya was in tna slash impact for a long time yeah and she you know again i think that she really picked it up once tessa tessa won the world title i think she said why not me um and uh and i think she really picked her game up to another level and i, I think there was a time there was a period of a few months where, for my money, Taya Valkyrie was the best, one of the best wrestlers in the world. Um, just, in, you know, in-ring performance, you know, delivery, character pieces, all of it. I just thought she was one of the best. Um, and so she's somebody that, that certainly should be considered. Um, you know, there's just been, there's been a lot. There's been a lot of, a lot of really, really great ones there. And I think that's a testament to, you know, just to the knockouts division, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, and when you hear them talk so glowingly about what the knockouts division means, that's the type of stuff they're talking about right there. Yeah. That type of legacy. All right. Down to our last two. All right. Uh, AK Infinity says, mailbag question. What? are the top five improvements you guys believe impact can make in 2022 that's a good one yeah so top right five improvements. so right now i'm very happy with the roster but if we're talking from a wrestling standpoint um the tag team division is a must that they fig- they fix this thing now I, last time we were podcasting, I had made a comment. I think we only have three tag teams in a division, right? The Finjuice, the Good Brothers, and the Bullet Club. And then the next episode came about. And I was like, oh, wait, we got Decay. We got Violent by Design. We got Rich Swan and Willie Mack. Um, who p- p- pretty much solidified himself as a tag team at this point. Um, I, I believe there was one other one. Um, but it was like, yo, they got tag teams. But why does it feel like they have three? Or a lot of the times they make you feel like they have two. 
they have the problem in the knockouts division too, where the most compelling angle is with the champion, and then the rest of the girls are just floating around. You know, like they don't, they've struggled to be like, here's a compelling angle for someone who's not wearing the belt. And we're having that problem with the tag team division too. Um, so that that's something they got to fix because the tag team division is boring right now because of who has the belts. Uh, we should only have to deal with them for another year and a half. I mean, another half a year, and they should be off the AEW, I'm sure. And um, we can just put this behind us, this uh, this nightmare that I was I, I was excited about when it came. I was like, yo, they bring in some star power to the company, and it's just it's it's been rough. Um, I'm gonna say. I'm not going to knock the marketing too much. Uh, that They can always improve that. They're just not going to. It's very clear. Uh, so the production, you know, the production quality, I think, is an absolute must. I just think they just need new people. Not Like, there's a certain... I have experience with audio engineering and stuff like that and video, but there's only so good I could make something sound if I was mixing something down like i think they really have to bring in some real real freaking professionals and um especially with social media too like this strategy of it 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 pops the impact faithful if you will when they're when they're piggybacking off news from other companies and you know like i was watching nxt and when steiner steiner's son um i forgot who said it to him basically made a reference of um oh it was a a champa uh Hell's his name? Uh, champion. Arm breaker is what they call him. No, no, the champion, Tommaso oh, Champa. Uh, uh, Tommaso Champa. He made a comment in re- in reference to the the Scott Steiner promo. Yeah. yeah so yeah. then Impact tweets it out with minutes. You know what I mean? And it pops the the hardcores. I just think it's a. I don't think that's a social media strategy for. It's not built for growth. Um, so. Yeah, I, I am gonna say the marketing and social media marketing. They have, they've got to improve. It. It's got to be better. Um, I would like to see them to take the YouTube membership thing just to the next level. Don't just, you know, they were like, oh, "There's gonna be an original programming." They have, they play like one Sammy Callahan um, original show on there. That was it, and it, all it is is just the monthly specials and watching right. Impact. Like, come on, you know, may, bring more value with that. I like to see that, and then um, yeah. So I already said the production quality of the show. Uh, so I, I would say the last one, uh, my favorite is the uh, the commentary. Improve the commentary. Mm. Uh, I mean, but when I say that, bring in like Veda Scott or something, someone good. The guy, the guy dude from Ring of Honor, who's excellent. Uh, just bring in some like good, uh, good commentary. All right, so my five things to improve Impact Wrestling or five things Impact Wrestling can do to improve in 2022. Number one, play bigger venues. Take a shot. Spend the money to hire local promoters to promote your, 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 your events in bigger markets. Get a bigger crowds in there. Make your stuff feel like a big deal. That's number one, play bigger venues. Number two, light the crowd. Even when you're in like Samstown Casino, if you get a good ass crowd, light the crowd, let people at home see that there are people there and active and enjoying your show. Okay. That's number two, light the crowd. Number three, take the audio, the commentary out of post production, do it live. Fuck it, we'll do it live. Do it live. Like, do it live. <laughs> like put your, put D Lo and Striker at the commentary table next to the ring while you're taping the show and get that commentary done live because it makes the show sound so much better. You can hear the crowd better, okay? Number four, promote your wrestlers better. Find some way to get these guys on different TV shows, different platforms, different commercials, different web shows, like, Find ways to get them exposure in front of people other than the impact faithful, okay? Like, promote your wrestlers better. And number five, go on a 
marketing campaign to convince people that fans are enjoying the show. I've talked about this many times. Whenever they go to a venue, they need to be outside in line with a camera interviewing people. Who are you looking forward to seeing tonight? So they can run a, cut a video of, I'm looking forward to seeing Josh Alexander. Deanna Perazzo is the worst. You know, uh, give me more Jordan Grace. Like you need to get people on camera saying this stuff. And then you need to cut that up, style it up and push it out on your social media. Push it on your episodes. You need to tell the world that the impact faithful is more people than you think it is. Okay, you need to, you, the, the biggest thing you can do to change the perception of impact as a product that nobody likes is to actively attack it, show people that fans are actually enjoying this show and engaging with it. You need to attack your perception problem because that's the number one thing I think hindering impact wrestling's development on a, uh, excuse me, their, you know, progression you know, in the eyes of many is the perception that people just don't like it. And it's the, you know, the dirty little kid you can kick down the stairs and nobody will care. Um, right. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, those are my five things that I think impact can do to uh, improve in 2022. What, what, what do you think about my list? Dude, you, you sounded so prepared. I'm sitting here on the top of my head, like, uh, <laughs> and it should be easy for me That's because why I let you go first. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Very strategic. It should be easy for me because I've been complaining about things for the company for years. But um yeah, there there's just improvements, small improvements that have to be made and larger improvements cannot happen until the small ones are done. That's, that's something that I was, was very was drilled in me uh my early days in the military that you cannot handle the bigger tasks unless you you mastered the smaller ones. So that's what angers me so much is that I feel like that small little things that can be fixed. I just don't think they think the little things are that important or the people, the powers that be don't feel there's a return on investment fixing the smaller things, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, But I just think, you know, you just have to, like you can bring in, you know, they say you can't polish a turd, you know, and make it look like a diamond or whatever the right. phrase is. Like, you can bring in as many awesome wrestlers as you want. And, you know, big names, you can bring in Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman and these dudes. But, you know, if the show doesn't look good and it doesn't sound good, it's just, it's going to come off like just another ring of honor. Like, you can put, you know, the microphone, for instance, I have this problem with NWA too. The microphone they do the ring announcing, like get a good microphone. That microphone sounds like shit. Right. Uh, right. I was watching this episode of NWA and Tim Storm yelled into the microphone and it was just straight distortion. Like you didn't even know what the hell he was saying. It sounded horrible. Right. Um, and I see, I hear it a lot with the ring announcing, you know, <laughs> like it's, it's not, <laughs> it's not crisp and clear. You know, um, so David Penzer, I'm going to say real quick, in an inter I, well, no, um, Melissa Santos said in an interview that after she did the knockouts knockdown that, that uh, David Penzer was worried he was going to lose his job. I'm like, he should 100% lose his job to her. Uh, I, he did the commentary one time on that TNA show and sounded really, really good. So, like, have him do that. Bring her in to do the ring announcing. Like, let's get sexy. Come on. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to throw in one bonus question here because I just, I like the way it was asked. <clears throat> we've kind of answered, we've kind of answered a little, a little bit of this before, but um, I just like the way it was asked. So Vito Scaletta says, hey, BQ and TW, which three men and three women free agents do you think will sign with Impact? Uh, also not to spoil, but Bronson Reed, wow, big man with prowess rated for you. Um, so two or three, not necessarily that you want to sign with Impact, but that you think actually will end up signing with Impact. Out of all the free agents we talk about, we've done a lot of free agent talk on this show. Um, what, give, give me three men and three women, you know, or two or three of each that you think Ooh. actually will end up signing with Impact. 
I think Buddy Matthews eventually will. Um, I got I got to give six names. You said three and three. Yeah, three and three, or or two and two, whatever. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say him for sure. Um, I'm going on a limb here a little bit. I think they're going I think uh, they would bring in Danhausen. I, because he's popular, yeah. very popular. He's one of the top 10 pro wrestling tees seller merch movers, which would make him someone AEW would want. I was going to say, I that, just, that, that, that makes him an AEW guy right there. Yeah, but I just can't see him fitting what they do at all. Like, he fits impact. Perfect. Mm. Um, they like that kind of weird comedy. And he actually is kind of funny. So I'm, I'm going to say him. Um I'm trying to think of a woman's name for the sake of argument. I'm, I'm going to, for the sake of argument, I, I do think there's a good chance they bring in uh, Mandy Leone. Um, I, I think there's a very good chance they do. That's just a gut feeling, not, yeah. I don't know. So I'm going to throw this, I'll just throw Angelina Love in there as well. Uh, Cause I think she does want to continue wrestling. I know she's doing her own thing uh, career wise. Um, I got those four. I can't. Uh, I, I'm sure there's a couple Ring of Honor names that 100% will come come over. It's just like who they're not probably that well known. You know what I mean? But th- there's a lot of Ring of Honor guys there for the picking. Picking. I know Silas Young was at the tapings. He's already publicly said he would like to work for AEW though. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's. A, I know um, Daniel Mo, Daniel Monet Summer Ray was at the last set of tapings. What, I've been would? saying, yeah. So I've been saying she would be great for the influence. You know, that's who I wanted to show up instead of Madison at one point. Yeah. Just because I thought she she lived the gimmick. It worked. You know. So I I, I don't know. I I can't really commit to that yeah. those answers. <laughs> yeah, you know, I do think I, I would say Buddy Matthews is the one I feel pretty good. Uh, mm-hmm. when it's all said and done, we'll we'll show up. Yeah. All right. So here's our. Our, our last question of of the show thank you guys so much for all your questions last one goes to michael spikes michael spikes says how can impact wrestling be big time again like the successful part of the tna days all right since you went uh on the last couple of bq i'll go on this one um to me the easy answer is you gotta get back on a network that's on a a, a regular tier cable package you got to get on a, you know, like a Paramount Network or, um, you know, TBS, TNT, not that any of those networks are actually looking for a wrestling product, but you got to get on something that has that type of exposure. Um, but, you know, it, it was a perfect storm when they originally had gotten on uh, Spike TV. You know, it was a new network. You know, wrestling was certainly in a much hotter place at the time. Um and, and, and they were the hot new, you know, wrestling product. They were the AEW of that day. And so um, just when you look at those crowds and the impact flashbacks, sometimes you're like, oh my God, like what happened? Yeah. Um, but, but for me, the number one thing they'd have to do is they'd have to get major network exposure in that way. They need some sort of deal that was, you know, where the network had a serious stake in the product and where they were going to pump money into it for production value and signing big stars and that type of thing. So um, that would be the number one thing they, they, they have to do, in my opinion, is get on um, a, a big network with uh, a big cable network with major distribution, something like that. Um, and then from there, I think they also would have to, um, this probably should have been in my five things, was adapt the takeover format for pay-per-views. Which is, again, I I can't stress enough, man, like creating pay-per-view events that people can't stop talking about when it's over. Like, it's just, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know what I mean? Like, that's just, you know, it is what it is. So that, and, um, and again, like some of the things for my five, for my five things, play bigger venues, you know, play bigger venues, um, promote, promote the fans you know, let people know that you have a fan base that's having fun watching your show. I think those are the things Impact can do to be big time again. 
this is a tough question for me because I, I know this sounds super negative. I don't think they can get there. So it's a little hard for me to answer that question. I think that they have to... I think the number three promotion is up for grabs. I think if, if uh, whether it's Jeff Jarrett or Triple H finds an investor, I think they can be a notch below AEW. Uh, they might not have the, you know, the TV deals aren't really out there for wrestling, so I don't know, but I'm not saying it necessarily would be better than Impact. I'm just saying it's up, it's up for grabs. I don't think Impact has a, they have a, a, a stranglehold on it by default right now because uh, there's no more Ring of Honor. NWA just isn't that good right now. MLW operates in a way that they operate in a way that they could surpass impact, but they're just way in popularity. See, so they're just way below it. Uh, but they're a lot more creative. Um, you know, in the in, in whether it's their marketing or just some of the match ideas, they're just, they're just more creative, but they're just not as popular. I think impact has to just be real that hey, we're competing with NWA and MLW. They're competing with the taped wrestling programs, and that's that's just where it is. I don't I don't know that they'll ever get to where they were, but you know, hypothetically they could with the right TV deal and then the production quality matching the TV deal. Because right now it matches Access TV, which is the problem. No other like a, a larger company is not going to watch what they have going on right now and be like, "Yo, we want that on our big network." Right. It's just mm-hmm. not. So you, you know. Dress for the job you want, not to dress the job you have. That's, I guess, what I want to see them do. Um, it don't look like, don't create. The, right now, the, the show comes off as, hey, 100,000 100, people watch on Access TV. So that's, that's what we're going to give you visually. That's just how it comes off to me. I, I would just, I think that is the first step to getting there because they're bringing in the wrestlers. They're bringing up better talent. But once it looks and sounds better, that I I would have to imagine might open up some more opportunity for, you know, probably you know per, perhaps a better deal. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So uh, I think we went a good amount of time right there. That was um, you know, we gave you guys some good solid content. It's Thanksgiving week. Um, well, by the time you get this, it'll be the week after Thanksgiving, but. You know, we'll be gearing up for a new week of impact and, you know, we'll be gearing up for a new week of content. By the time you guys get this, it'll probably be Monday, Monday afternoon, something like that. But definitely make sure you drop your comments in the comments below. Um, as you can see, you know, we're going to get back to you, drop your name and where you're from so that we can give you a shout out and, you know, leave us good questions. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, talk to us, tweet, tweet me on Twitter. I tweet back. Uh, BQ, tell the people where they can find you on social. At BQ Speaks on Twitter, at the Impact Lounge on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me at TW Talking About on your social media of choice, or you can follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. Um, like I said, tweet me. I tweet back. You know, I talk about Impact, talk about AEW, talk about WWE, talk about anything, any and everything. You want relationship advice? I can do that too. Okay. All right. Um, I'm 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 a, a, a expert on pretty much everything you want to know. Um, you want to know how to fix a flat? Um, you know, I, I got you. Okay. Uh, um, that's all we got for this show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Before you go, make sure you hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. Um, make sure to share this with a friend. Drop it in their email. Drop it in their comments. You know, uh, text it to them, anything. Tell them these two guys are geniuses. Tell them these two guys are idiots. But whatever you do, tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's bring more people into the conversation. For BQ, I'm TW. Peace.